The Tom Woods Show, episode 1765. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, the astonishingly delicious Press House Coffee is now the official coffee of The Tom Woods Show. Take 20% off your first order when you go to PressHouseCoffee.com and use promo code WOODS at checkout. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. We're talking today with Kevin McKernan, who is going to tell us about the controversy surrounding the PCR testing. We hear a lot about that when we're talking about finding out whether people have COVID or not or whether they're infectious or not. It's come down a lot to the question of this PCR testing. And the, well, you know what? I'm going to let him explain to you. You've heard me talk about it a little bit, but Kevin is about as much of an expert as you could ask for on this. I'll have him describe his background to us, but I'm going to have the full details of who he is on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 1765. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate you having me on. I'd love to catch up with your group on uh, on PCR. A lot of mess going on up there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So before we get into that, I want you to be not humble. I want you to tell people exactly why your opinion on this matters. Tell us about your background. Okay, so in uh, from 1996 to 2000, um, I ran the research and development team at MIT with uh, for Eric Lander on the Human Genome Project. This was a, a not not the only lab in the world. A lot of labs contributed, but there was a really sizable contribution coming out of Cambridge. And so I built a robotic pipeline that did millions and millions of PCRs. Uh, so I'm, I'm very familiar with robotics and liquid handling and the parts of the automated process that might contribute to contamination. Uh, and also where PCR falls apart. And right now, a lot of that is is really not technical, it's communication, and hopefully we'll, we'll touch on that a bit. All right, let's start with the most basic thing. What does PCR stand for, and what is it? So it stands for uh, polymerase chain reaction, and it is a way of amplifying a single molecule of DNA into millions of copies of DNA in a couple hours. Usually, uh, probably under 90 minutes, this can be done. And in the process of amplifying it, you can get a better measurement on how much of it is you have around. So you can count molecules this way. And that's often a, a version of PCR that we have in COVID testing known as quantitative PCR. These are ones that have some fluorescent dyes involved so that you can monitor the course of PCR in real time. And you can see and calculate how much is in the sample, what the initial number of molecules are in the sample. It's very specific. So it's very, very good at differentiating one virus from another. And uh, and sometimes that's its downfall. Uh, I think you may have heard probably some critiques of PCR in the news lately from its inventor, Kerry Mullis, uh, who I've known. He's he's passed, sadly, and I wish you were around to help defend these things. But some of his criticisms about it were not necessarily related to COVID. They were related to his doubt that HIV actually was the only virus involved in uh, in AIDS. Uh, I don't think we have that conflation going on in COVID at the moment. All right, so let's talk about then, indeed, what we've been reading. We laymen have been reading about this, if we've been paying attention. I think the most high-profile thing on it was that New York Times article probably five, six weeks ago now, and the headline was something like, was your coronavirus test positive? Maybe it shouldn't have been, something like that. Yes. And that was saying that in some jurisdictions around the United States, the, the testing was so sensitive that people were getting results that for all practical purposes were really not useful for anything. So what, what's going on with that? So there's, I think the main problem we have is we have got the, the news is basically speaking about this problem like earthquakes while hiding the Richter scale. Uh, so it's very hard to have a coherent uh, discussion because the, the values in these tests aren't being shared. They're just they're turning what is a very quantitative test into a plus minus answer. And that's, that's the biggest problem we've got. We've got to get the CQ values or the cycle threshold values public. This is something that is, it's a test that has linear dynamic range over six orders of magnitude, okay? It's an incredibly valuable test because you can measure a single molecule or a million molecules with the same test. However, they're hiding that data. That data is getting omitted. And, and so you just get a positive negative result and you're left questioning, well, did I have a single copy of the virus or did I have a million copies of the virus? I kind of like to know. If you have a single copy, odds are you're probably not infectious and you shouldn't be quarantined. If you have a million, you probably should be. 
Um, but this is getting distilled into a black and white answer. I think on the conservative side, that if you find a single molecule, you still quarantine people. Uh, and there's some weaknesses there. Um, there are some weaknesses that I think that New York Times article was speaking to is that many of the fragments at the later stage of the infection are in fact non-infective. You can pick up RNA from a virus that's not inside the virus shell, if you will. All the, most of these viruses have a protein coat and your, your audience may have heard of a, a spike protein that's on that coat that helps it get into the cell through the ACE2 receptor. Well, when that's not there, the virus is just RNA and your, your body will dispose of it and degrade it over time. But PCR can still pick that up. Uh, it can still pick up single molecules of RNA that don't have a protein coat on them and therefore they're not infectious. And a large part of the testing window of a, of a patient who has COVID is in this viral clearance phase, this phase where they are shedding dead virus and there's more dead virus than live virus, and it's therefore not a viable virus. Uh, and there is some publications I'll hopefully um, point you to in the literature on this that speak to people correlating their quantitative PCR results to how these viruses behave when you put them into cells and whether they actually infect, if they, whether they're still infectious or not. There's a paper from Jaffer, uh, J-A-A-F-A-R, who did this work in DDR Real Lab. DDR is known for his um, hydroxychloroquine work, but he's also done a very, very prolific work on qPCR and quantitating how effective certain qPCR values are. And their assay is coming in around 33. 33, 35, after that, it's the CQ value is no longer predictive of infective virus. Now, that number is probably different for every single test that's out there. And that's what I think is complicating the communication on this. Ah, okay. All right. Because I, I, I had been hearing people saying that anything higher than 30 was already suspect. And then I even heard that there are some European sources that have cranked it up as high as 45. That, I think, is actually... They may be liable for that. If that is past their limit of detection, a class action lawsuit will probably hold them accountable. Um, mainly because in, in, in these, these um, when you validate a PCR test like this, there are several bodies out there that can help bring a consensus along as to what are the best practices for doing it. AOEC is one of them, and we work with them closely for building these viral tests in the cannabis industry. But they will always have you do a limit of detection assay to validate this. And what, what that does is you, you take the target molecule that you're trying to amplify and you serially dilute it all the way down to a single molecule. And then you run your test and you record, can I pick this up down at a single molecule or does my assay fall apart at 50 molecules or 100 molecules? Most of the COVID tests are, have no capacity to detect past 50 molecules. They just don't have the sensitivity. Uh, it's hard to get RNA to amplify. They're not as sensitive as DNA-based tests. And so they crap out at 50 copies Someone who's pushing it out to 45 is probably detecting past their limit of detection, and they shouldn't be calling patients in that zone because your assay clearly doesn't have the detection capability to pick them up there. Now, you will also see uh, uh, this further confused in the news in that some of these people will claim, the manufacturers will claim that my test does not pick up anything in the negative control out to 45. And, and that, that we need to be careful of. That, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily calling somebody out of 44. They're just promising the people who use their test that they've run the test to ensure that if you add water to the test, we don't get any background signal all the way out 45 cycles. And, that, and that's actually a good bragging point for a lot of tests. So you want to make sure that the, the vendor... You're not mixing up what they're bragging about, that, hey, my, st my test stays really clean out to 45 cycles with I'm making calls out at 44. Because uh, the latter is probably clinically negligent and the former is actually good practice. What are the consequences of, of this problem? I mean, I suppose the primary one is that a lot of people, who knows how many, have been forced to quarantine for really no reason, for effectively no reason, and that this is profoundly disruptive to society when it just keeps happening and all of a sudden arbitrarily this is disrupted and that's disrupted and people's lives are thrown into turmoil. Am I getting what the main issue is here or is there more? Uh, you're, you're kneeling on the head. And I, I put out a bit of a tweet storm on this because uh, I'm concerned that the longer the tail end window of positivity exists, like if we have really, really sensitive tests and we're picking up non-infectious people and the majority of the life cycle of the disease is that long tail of, you, of your lower lowering your infectivity, 
every time you capture somebody with a positive test in that long tail, you create a chain reaction of five or 10 more tests because then your household has to get tested and then your contact map should probably get tested. And that creates what I call a testing r naught, which is the r naught of how many, how much one positive test chain reacts into how many more tests. If that r naught is higher than the r naught of the virus, this pandemic won't end. So I think we really need to draw attention to that, get these CQ values public and get people talking about and, and perhaps putting a little bit more research toward the direction of uh, how viable is this and at what number should the cutoff be? I mean, 30, 30 was brought up in the New York Times article, and that's probably the right number for the assay that they were using. We have lots of assays in the marketplace, and I do not want to uh, be advocating for us to all standardize on a single assay because we tried that with the CDC and we ended up with no assays or contaminated assays. So I, I like competition in the marketplace, but with that requires consumers to be a little bit more aware of um, some of the different attributes and to ask more questions and get more uh, you know, specifications on how these things differ. Um, my, my main concern and what precipitated me writing that tweet storm was that I went to a COVID testing center recently and in asking the clerks or the nurses there, what was the false positive rate of the test? They couldn't answer it. What was the false negative rate of the test? They had no answer. I asked them, what was the positivity of the test? Like how many people were you getting positive per day? They didn't know. And I asked, well, who gets this information? Is it going to get reported to, you know, uh, to the public health department in my town and I'm going to get harassed to, to be in my home? Or is it, they said, oh, we only report the positive tests. <laughs> I'm like, well, if you only report the positive test, how do you, you have no denominator. How do you know the percent positivity? How do you know if the pandemic's ending? You have to report both to the state, don't you? And it, it, effectively, I had less confidence in getting COVID tested than I might have at, like with a bud tender at a dispensary. Uh, yeah. It's just, it's just uh, you know, atrocious. Well, I mean, it would, it would be like inventing a new currency, you know, the, the, the Tom. Yeah. The toms, you know, and then saying, well, uh, you know, this drum set costs 500 Toms, but you don't know what that, maybe that's cheap, maybe that's expensive. I have nothing to compare that to because this is just an isolated number with no context. Now, now beyond that, it seems to me the, the other key thing here is that obviously the number of so-called cases out there is inflated by some factor we can't know because of this problem. And then, of course, the inflation of that number leads politicians to take more draconian measures. So you would think there would be more people. Now, there are some, but you'd think there'd be more people saying, now, wait a minute, before we jump and panic here, we should realize that a lot of these are going to be, by the nature of these tests, fun at least functional false positives. And yet I have not heard Dr. Fauci address this at all. It's like it's not even happening. And, and I remember him specifically saying, as we head into flu season, you know, I really don't like to see the case count per day at, you know, 40,000. I'd rather see it, you know, like 10 or something. But maybe it is at 10, like, you know, maybe yeah. because of this problem. Maybe you've already got your wish and it's not even coming up. Yeah, there, there's a couple points there. For not to be spoken about, is it, it's almost like it's getting brushed under the rug because you, you can have an increased positivity because kids go back to school. And that's a different age demographic that we shouldn't be worried about if the positivity goes up because the, the viral load's probably lower. Um, and this is one reason why I've been trying to really push for CQs getting out because the viral load is believed to be at a lower rate in the patients that are less affected by this. Uh, so you, you might actually see that the viral load's going down while the positivity is going up, but we can't see that right now. And we shouldn't be worried about kids having a higher positivity rate because as, as the, you know, you had Martin um, Cold, our friend here, as he eloquently pointed out, there's a thousand fold difference in risk according to age. All right. So this shouldn't ring any alarm bells. And then the, the, the false positive rate is not really known jurisdiction to jurisdiction unless you do a lot of digging. Like I happen to know what the positivity rates are here in Cambridge because uh, we have an, we've got a business here and we keep track of these things. And the Northeastern University is at about one in 2000 positivity rate. That's really low. In fact, that's so low, I suspect most of those positives are probably false positives because it's getting really close to the, the false positive rates that are reported on some of these tests in their emergency youth authorizations. I've also heard from a group in Melbourne, Australia, who's was going through a horrendous lockdown, that they, the last like 54,000 tests they ran were all negative. Uh, so that's really impressive. That means their false negative rate has got to be at least lower than that. Um, yet they're still locked down. Um, so, uh, and then I've heard in the UK and other places, people estimating these things as high as 1%. Well, if it's at 1% and the disease prevalence goes down to 1%, you're not going to know which one of your positive. You have a 50-50 chance that your positives are going to be false or true, and you won't know which ones they are. 
So that you know the disease prevalence play, plays an important role. When your when your disease prevalence gets low, like it is now, your false positive rate needs to be even lower, tenfold lower, maybe a hundredfold lower, so that you have the confidence that the positives you're calling are are, are a real risk to society. Um, so that's one issue on the false positives. And I think the second issue, you know, we touched on already, which is these positive tests do not correlate necessarily with symptoms uh, because we're not differentiating live virus from infectious virus, or I should say dead virus from infectious virus. Uh, and, and there are some ways to do that. I, I point people to the tweet storm I put out as to how people can do that because uh, it's, it's a, bit, a bit involved and it, it needs some diagrams. But that is technology that is available today. It's quite old school technology, but I don't think there's a motivation to implement it because this long tail of infectivity is driving a massive testing boom. Billions and billions of dollars in testing revenue is on the table right now. Nobody wants to tighten down that dial. Ah, okay. Well, that was actually going to be my next question was, you know, what alternatives do we have? Is there any other way of uh, assessing whether somebody is actually in a condition where he's infectious or not? And I, of course, on the show notes page, I'm going to link to the, when you say this tweet storm, it's a series of tweets. And then I found a, a place where they, they took all your tweets and made it into one big, easily read post. So I'll link to that at tomwoods.com slash 1765 so people can look at it for themselves. By the way, I did not know, I swear to you, I did not know, because I first looked at this on Twitter and I was just trying to follow your argument and read all this technical stuff. I didn't get down to the, or at least I guess I did, I didn't realize it was, I think I saw the, the, the thing involving me separately, and I didn't realize it was part of this whole tweet oh, yeah, storm, yeah. That, that you actually included my video from Jekyll Island Conference. I thought, yeah, the cherry on top. I have a way of trying to trap people toward your videos. <laughs> uh, well, I thought, well, then, I, then I wrote to you, and then I saw that you would tweet, or you, know, you had included my video, and I thought, oh, he must think I'm some kind of ego case. I reach out to people because they tweet my videos, but no, honestly, no, no, no. it was because the the level of analysis you had was so significant. So, all right, so so here we are in this situation then, that according to you, there is not likely to be a, a resolution to this problem, yet it's a major problem, and it is not only inconveniencing and really throwing a lot of people's lives into all kinds of disarray because of arbitrary quarantine, but also it is fueling the whole case-demic problem because of the, the, the numbers that these types of tests are yielding. Jeez, uh, well, I mean, is there any sign of hope here? I mean, I, I hate to leave people like this. I'm very much worried about it because it is creating a lot of public distrust. And if we ever do have a resurgence, I, I'm a little bit skeptical that we're going to have a massive resurgence because coronaviruses don't do this. The history of them is they cycle you know, two to four years and so I'm somewhat suspect that second waves are coming, but we are going to be blind to it as a society because nobody trusts these things. And it's not because PCR is effective. It's really the most effective tool for the job here. It's that we're just simply failing to communicate the most valuable data from the test, which is the, the log scale that it runs on. And as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's literally like trying to have debates on how to you know, manage earthquakes without the Richter scale. It's, I'm stunned that this data is not being put forward, uh, considering all the other data that's available in COVID. I mean, you can go to a lot of these testing sites and they'll have the percent positivity on the site. They'll have the number of tests per day. They, they do wonderful jobs putting all this other data public. But the one thing that really matters is the only thing that's not there. Um, so I, I would just encourage people to continue to demand for it, ask for it, push for home testing as well, because there is a, a massive risk with all of this data being centralized that we don't really know how the numbers are being crunched. And re really the world we should be looking for is home testing where you can test in the privacy of your home and make a decision, just like a pregnancy test and what, where you want to go and what you want to do with this. And even though these tests are a thousand, these tests may be a hundred to a thousand fold less sensitive, that's okay, because you can afford to take them twice, you know, you know, a couple hours apart or a couple days apart. And that gives you information of the virus load going up or down when you have two time points like that. Uh, so I think the, the FDA is in the way of that right now. They, they don't want to allow home testing unless home testing is as sensitive as qPCR. And that's just crazy. Yeah. It, it shouldn't be. You just need enough to, to know whether you're moving into this really high rate of viral shedding and viral um, load, which you have in the acute period where you're sick. But you don't really need to be picking up the long tail. Uh, and, and if they're cheap and fast, you can do them twice, which is the most valuable thing you can do because it, it will eliminate false positives by doing them twice. And you'll also get time points to know whether it's growing or shrinking in your system. So the home testing is, I think, the win just because it fits with personal liberty. It fits with my data, my time. I don't need the, the, 
the town health department telling me what to be doing with this data when they themselves don't even know what a false positive is. Uh, so um, I, I've been kind of a strong advocate on that front because I think it resonates with personalized medicine. And uh, where we're headed with all this is a surveillance state on qPCR, and that's not personalized medicine. It never will be. Hey, everybody, let's take a quick break to thank our sponsor, the official coffee of the Tom Woods Show, Press House Coffee. Are you a real Tom Woods Show listener? You've got to be drinking this coffee. This is the coffee that made me, at age 48, into a coffee drinker. Their flavored coffees are not coffee with some chemical on them to make them taste a certain way. They actually blend real coffees together so that they approximate these amazing flavors. I cannot get over the key lime pie and the blueberry muffin. Absolutely delicious. I have it just with cream only. I don't even need sugar. Just cream complements it so beautifully. It's delicious. Well, the folks at Press House Coffee love French press coffee because long, direct, and even contact between the water and coffee make it second to none when it comes to delivering a full-bodied cup with the beautifully flavorful, antioxidant-rich oils of the beans still intact. And the daily grind from Press House is the world's easiest way to enjoy it every day. No fiddling with grind settings, no scales or experimentation. They've already done that for you no matter how much you brew at a time. Just heat up your water, rip open the pouch, and enjoy. The battle between quality and convenience is over. Head over to PressHouseCoffee.com and get 20% off your first order when you use promo code WOODS at checkout. That's PressHouseCoffee.com, promo code WOODS. I remember seeing probably two months ago Boris Johnson over in the UK saying that what they were hoping to shoot for was a kind of test that would be rapid uh, on a large scale that could be given to, let's say, spectators at a theater event as they arrive so that, you know, maybe they have to arrive early, but they can test and be sure that the production can go on safely, even with a full audience, because everybody in the audience has tested negative. Do you know about such a test? Is, can, is it conceivable to have such a test? There, there is. Uh, Zen Zhang, who is who well known for his work in the CRISPR field, he's out of the Broad Institute, has built a CRISPR-based test like that that's probably 15 or 20 minutes. Um, it's either getting commercialized through Sherlock or through Mammoth. Um, those are two to keep your eyes on. They recently just got a tremendous amount of um, grant money, however. So um, and I, I say that tongue-in-cheek in that I've, I've lived through a lot of government grants, and oftentimes the grant money poisons the success. Because uh, it, it doesn't always, uh, you end up responding to the reviewers as opposed to the marketplace. But uh, that, that's probably a topic for another cast. Uh, but he's he's an, he's a good one to follow. Um, but these tests are are probably ten uh, to twenty minute tests. Uh, they often use um, a technology called LAMP. We have some of that technology on our website as well. We we do use some of these tests in the cannabis industry to figure out the sex of a plant and whether or not it's infected with certain viruses. Uh, they're very effective and they're simple and color metric and they, you, you can take it, you can get the answer with like the hardware on your phone. You don't need like a, a sophisticated qPCR instrument. But the biggest hurdle there is FDA. Uh, the, the technologies work. It's just the FDA blessing it to work given the lower sensitivity of those tests. Okay. It's incredible to me that, I know, at this point you would think Woods here of all people should not be surprised at things like this, but there's nobody at the FDA that sees the the opposite problem of an excessively sensitive test. I mean, really, none of them see the problem. You know, I it's well, I, you've probably had a few guests on have spoken about death by regulation. What is her name again? Mary uh, Mary Ruart. Ru, yes, yeah. Let's let's get her on to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's just crazy. I mean, it's just crazy. This is obviously a problem, and and especially when. Uh, I think there are places in the world where they're being more reasonable with the testing. Absolutely. Uh, that, would, that would laugh at us if they saw what well, was going on. Here. I mean, if you just look at the history of this, books will be written about it, right? So South Korea got testing up and running faster than we did. And PCR was invented by Kerry Mollison, in California. And it's been off patent for several years. It's not like this is some new bleeding edge technology. It's, it's quite generic now. But why did South Korea get it running before we did? A lot of that, um, I've been on another cast with uh, Brittany Schaefer about this, but a lot of that is just due to the, the regulations we have here, that the CDC declared a monopoly on this. So no company like ours would bother getting into the space because you know it's going to be run by the CDC. They drop the ball, they fumble it, they then say, fine, everyone can do it. Then the next hurdle you have to get through is an emergency youth authorization by the FDA. I mean, just the logic of this is like when there's an emergency, here's some additional paperwork for you to fill out before you break the glass, right? 
it makes no sense. Like in case of fire, you know, break glass. No, no. In case of a bird. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but yet on the other hand, you get the sense that when it comes to vaccines, they really have pulled out all the stops to, to just they have. fast track things. Yes. And I do think there's an active, um, whether it's intentional or not, uh, the money flows through all that system don't favor generics. And so the, you know, the whole hydroxychloroquine system has been just wrecked because there's no really pharmaceutical company that has a marketing budget that's going to help push that through. And so instead, you get companies that have patented compounds like remdesivir uh, who are setting up studies to actually try to destroy hydroxychloroquine, uh, to, to kill the generic so that they can elevate remdesivir in light of it. So um, you get all of these weird incentive structures. Yeah. But remdesivir just had a, a very unfortunate paper published against it, I understand. Yes. Ironically, after it was deemed, uh, I think it was just approved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was the, I forget the, what the exact term or the exact wording Dr. Fauci used, that it, was, it would be the standard of care. And then they found that there was no, there turned out to be no, no thing. benefit from it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the papers continue to fly on hydroxychloroquine having some benefit. I mean, it's, it's by no means a black and white story, but uh, I think if you go to C19, I'll have to forward you a link for all, all the HCQ studies are now collected on one website. And there's something like 70% green. Like most of the studies are 30% say no benefit and 30 and 70% say that there are, but, um, you know, a lot of the ones that showed no benefit were, you know, they, they, as you know, they, they, they gave them toxic levels of, uh, of the drug. Uh, and so there there's, and, and those studies, um, yeah. So there, there's a certain a bias in our, in our FDA system for drugs that have no owners. You know, if, if it's a generic drug, if it's a natural medicine, like cannabis, all of these things are, are going to get piled on and, and, and suppressed in favor of something that has a, a patent on it because the patented compounds have the marketing budgets behind them that can get through the cost of the FDA. Uh, and I think a lot of that's going on with the vaccines too. There's all types of liability waivers in the vaccines. There's billions of dollars being funneled into them, but uh, vitamin D is probably be more effective right now. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting that in recent, again, maybe two months ago, it sort of became mainstream to point out that uh, a lot of people who struggle in particular with COVID have vitamin D deficiency. And we even have Dr. Fauci saying, yeah, I take vitamin D regularly. And he even, I believe, said that it's probably a good idea for people to take given the current circumstances. But I remember when saying you should have, and I'm not even an alternative health sort of guy. I, I'm just a spectator when it comes to that. I don't know enough to have an opinion. I just remember people saying, you know, you probably should should be taking some vitamin D. And everybody's, oh, you crazy quack. <laughs> right? No way. And and now it's sort of like, well, yeah, we all knew that. No, no, you didn't actually. Nope, you're not allowed to get away with that. No. <laughs> you made fun of the osteopaths and we're coming after you for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so tell me, what sources do you look at? Because you obviously have a really good handle on a very important piece of this overall puzzle. But nobody can be an expert on everything. And I'm sure you're as curious day to day as I am about what's going on and what the political response is and, and what the trends are. Where do you look for your information? So I, tr I first really look at what people's funding sources are because I find that predominantly motivates their, um, their bias. Uh, and it's been, it's been exacerbating COVID. I mean, the, the political fights that you see on Twitter right now, they are so clearly polarized into Biden versus Trump scientists that it's those people I just pass by. Um, and if their funding source is coming from, you know, the government or the Gates Foundation, I'm a little, they tend to be more lockdown-y than others. So I have been looking mostly at scientists that are in the free market and are looking at this because uh, they're seeing the economy implode upon them. And if they don't get involved, it may end their business. Uh, and these folks seem to be a little bit more aware of the economics issues. I mean, one group I've been paying um, close attention to is this Panda group that I think you had Tom Hudson, um, or I'm sorry, Nick Hudson on uh, very recently, didn't you? Yes, Yes. Uh, yeah. So he's got, you know, he's got a great circle of people that are from all over the world that are, you know, not united by any type of em em employment contract, but are just, you know, united in their curiosity of trying to get to the bottom of this. And uh, they seem to have less conflicts. Uh, and I get, you know, a cleaner story from them. So if folks, you know, are looking to, I think there's some statisticians there and they may even have a donation page. I'd point your attention to them because I think they are, they're doing good work and that they have good modeling going on. And we need something other than the constant Ferguson models being thrown at us. And the reason we're getting those Ferguson models is that Gates and other people are funding that narrative. And I, I've seen this story in the cannabis industry. We have NIDA, which is the National Institute of Drug Abuse, funded by the federal government to predominantly make negative information about cannabis. Uh, yet no one's ever died from this drug. 
and so there's an entire institution that's there to create propaganda. And uh, that's going on, I think, in a lot of these epidemiology centers is they are predominantly funded through government. And uh, the more alarmist they become, the more money they get. Uh, and so you, you have to, you got to get rid of that noise out of your thread and, uh, and find folks that don't have those financial motivations. It's not always easy, but Panda is a good place to start. Yeah, so obviously I second that given that I had Nick on the show. So we'll put this stuff up also on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 1765. Any parting words, any, anything that, of your own that you'd like me to direct people to or any final words? So we do a lot of work of testing viruses in the cannabis field. So if anyone's in that marketplace and needs genomic um, expertise, that's what we do at Medicinal Genomics. We make tests that pick up the pathogens on cannabis. And we also make um, DNA SNP arrays for people to do molecular breeding with cannabis. So uh, we're in the genomic space. We're just focusing it on the world's most productive uh, and valuable crop as opposed to um, focusing in the healthcare system. We were in the healthcare system before, but after the, uh, uh, what was it? The AMA came out, just wrecked the reimbursement in that space and made it very complicated to operate doing human genetics. And so we pivoted into um, the cannabis field where there seems to be less of that. Surprisingly, <laughs> the uh, partially illegal industry is less regulated than healthcare. <laughs> yeah, um, how about that? All right, so uh, everything that we've talked about, I'll put up at tomwoods.com slash 1765. All right, I think I have kept you the exact amount of time that I planned to. I appreciate you doing this on such short notice, but when I saw what you had written on this, and then I saw we followed each other on Twitter, and then I went in my email and I saw we had corresponded before, I thought, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm getting this this guy on the show and I'm glad I did. Thanks so much. Well, hey, thanks. I'm going to look forward to the Tom Woods bump because I know it's big. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you can expect it. Thanks again. All right, cheers. Okay, everybody, two things to tell you about before we wrap up. The first is that a Tom Woods show listener who is a homeschooler or their homeschooling family just started a website called homeschoolburrito.com that I think you might find interesting. You can, at that site, learn about homeschooling from somebody who's actually doing it, listen to a podcast about that family's experience with homeschooling, get tips from guests on that podcast about homeschooling, and just get a really unique perspective on it. So check it out at homeschoolburrito.com. I know there are a lot of people who are considering homeschooling. Uh, maybe some folks decided on balance they were going to send the kids back to school, but maybe you're unhappy. A couple of months in, maybe you don't like the social distancing and the masks and whatever, and you're thinking about homeschooling again, well, check out homeschoolburrito.com by a Tom Wood Show listener. I'll link to it on the show notes page. And of course, remember, you can get nice publicity like this for a website you're thinking of creating. As long as you get your hosting through my link, then I'll promote your site on the show and give you some tutorials to help you get up to speed quickly, give you membership in my private bloggers group, a lot of great benefits. They're all absolutely free. Just get your hosting through my link and you're gonna get a great deal on the hosting also. Get the details on how to do all this at tomwoods.com slash publicity. Now, the second thing is, I want to tell you what's coming up tomorrow. You may remember, longtime listeners remember Dominic Frisbee, who's our friend over in the UK. And I'm having him back on to tell us what is going on over there with the lockdowns, which have become, I don't know how you make sense of the different restrictions and allowances, because there are some things you can do that actually seem riskier than others, but they're still letting you do those and not do other things. Who even knows how to make sense of all of it? But Dom is going to give us a firsthand account of what's going on over there on tomorrow's episode. So if you like and appreciate what's going on here on the Tom Wood Show, make sure and become a supporting listener over at supportinglisteners.com. You get many, many benefits, not least of which is membership in the Tom Wood Show Elite, which is my private group. And of course, I just had a big event at my house because I knew that a lot of folks listening are in states where they haven't been able to do anything for months and months and months. And I said, well, come on over to my house and we're going to be normal people for a little while. And that's exactly what we did. So as a member of the Supporting Listeners program, you get all kinds of lovely unannounced bonuses. And <laughs> that's one of them. So check it out at supportinglisteners.com and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.